A few years ago, our son, Haniel, chose to study the book of Revelation, of all books of the Bible, the book of Revelation, as part of his spiritual nourishment. In the weeks that followed, he would ask all kinds of questions about the seemingly unreal animals that have multiple heads, multiple eyes. Sometimes about the chronology of events, the interpretations of signs and symbols. And sometimes he asks about the catastrophe, the wars, the unbearable pains inflicted upon people. His questions went on and on and on. As parents, we notice his confusion and bewilderment was real. We try to answer his questions to the best of our ability. I'm not sure if they were very satisfying. Or even did we help him to resolve some of his tension in what he was feeling just by reading the book of Revelation, especially the latter part. I was anxious as his father, worried if he would understand what he was reading. By getting his interpretation of the symbols, the signs, and the timeline accurately. But as I read Revelation 22, 7, this is what Jesus says. Listen to the words. I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this, of the prophecy written in this scroll. Friends, like Pastor Nate said earlier, and similar to Mark 13, the book of Revelation raises all kinds of emotions and questions. However, the words of Jesus I just read in Revelation 22, 7, is reassuring what we need to pay attention to is the keeping of the words, not in solving the dilemma in scriptures, because we don't have the resources to do that, humanly speaking. There are so many things in scripture that we cannot solve them here on this earth. Again, Jesus said this. You are blessed when you keep the words written in this scroll. Let us pray. This morning we ask for your help. I ask that you will anoint me. That you will use the words that will come out of my mouth to be yours. Spirit of a living God, you are a helper. So we implore you to help us this day, even in the delivery of this message. Thank you very much for bringing honor and glory to the Lamb that was slain, our soon coming King. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, from the previous sermons that Pastor Nate had preached the past few months, especially this last month, we do notice that. Tension between Jesus and the religious and political leaders has been building up. And Jesus uses different occasions and situations to denounce the barrenness of both the religious leader as well as the political leaders. And Jesus specifically spoke against the abuse of the temple. In Mark 13, that our sister Virginia read, we noticed that Jesus was sitting on Mount Olives, opposite the temple. And he gave instructions to his disciples. He said, some few things that will help them turn away from unfruitful human institution, like the temple, to a relationship that depends on the promises and the plans of God. And also to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit and the promise of being gathered together to Jesus when he returns. I will invite you to look closely to Mark 13, particularly as we look at the first four verses to see the introduction to this chapter. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said, Hey, teacher, look, this beautiful building. I thought that was fair. That was okay. Jesus replied, Not a single stone here will be left on another. That was a jocular statement. 
Someone is expressing his delight. And this is Jesus' response. Not a single stone will be left. And as a follow-up to Jesus' response, four disciples, Peter, James, John, and James, asked him privately, when will all these things happen? And what will be the sign that they will be, or they are about to be fulfilled? Now, the prediction of the destruction of the temple came to pass because the Jewish historian Joseph recorded that the temple was destroyed around 70 AD. Unfortunately, some of the instruction that Jesus gave here, if we had read through the entire chapter where he said, if you are outside of the city, don't come back to the city, flee instead. Some of them returned back to the city because normally the cities are the most fortified places of refuge. There are walls that are built around it. Therefore, they came in seeking safety. Unfortunately, they were rounded up and were killed. Friends, the predictions of Jesus must be taken seriously. His words must be accepted, believed, and lived upon. Now, we are living in between history, the destruction of the temple, and the future, the prediction of the coming uh, Lord and Savior. This is a new era altogether. And in Mark 1.15, Jesus proclaimed, this, uh, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news because the kingdom of God has come near. Friends, this is the inauguration of God's already but not yet kingdom. In other words, with this proclamation, Jesus introduces the reign of God on earth as far as his mission was concerned. Now to help us in our waiting, just as we had heard from the sermon, the, 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 the children's sermon, there are three things that I notice from this entire chapter. Three instructions given by Jesus. As a matter of fact, there are about 18 warnings or instructions, imperatives that Jesus gave in this chapter, but we don't have the time for that in a single sermon. The first thing that we will notice is that Jesus warns his disciples to be to beware of imposters. In other words, Run away from people that will deceive you. Jesus said, watch out. Those were the first statement Jesus made. And the very last statement also in chapter 13 is, watch. I say this to you. Be on your guard. Be active. Be awake. Why would Jesus say this? Because from what he to all his disciples, false messiah, false prophet can deceive us. Yes, it is possible for us to be deceived by the imposters. That is why Jesus gave this stern warning. Friends, Jesus wants that being deceived is possible, especially some that will claim that God is an ally to their cause and to their activities. Sometimes we are gullible and accept the simple but erroneous solutions to the problems that life forces on us. There are stories of people who either explicitly or implicitly claim to be Messiah. I wouldn't bother you with a list of names, even contemporary names. But I want to draw our attention when Jesus said, watch out. The word translated watch out is best translated as discernment, to discern. It is to understand something beyond the surface, a careful reflection or analysis of a person or a situation. In our own situation, in our own case, Jesus is inviting his disciples and now us to discern, to watch carefully. What we hear, what we say as well. I wonder if you've ever heard words like, 
How could I have known he or she was fake? He or she was kind, pious, religious, persuasive, charismatic, eloquent. I mean, he or she has this aura or charm that draws people. Jesus warns, don't be fooled by the results they produce. Because results are not enough. And this is why he said, even false messiah, false prophets will perform miracles. Neither is eloquence a measure of Christ-like character. Because they will use Bible language here. They said, I am he. The very language that used Jesus and God used to self-identify. I am the bread of life. I am the truth. When Moses asked God, who should I say you are? He said, I am. This is the sacred language used. These people will use same language so that they can deceive us. Can you see why we need to be serious in discerning? I hope you don't hear me say charismatic or eloquent preachers or teachers are more likely to be imposters. No, that is not what I'm saying. My encouragement to you is to look beyond the surface. But also, to be on your guard. Perhaps you might be the one spreading, like Pastor Nate uh, hinted earlier on, you might be the one spreading lies, falsehood. You might be the one. Jesus said, take heed. Brothers and sisters, Jesus put the responsibility on his disciples to discern false claims about the gospel. Friends, Paul was very clear in his warning here in Colossians 2.8. He said, see to it that no one takes you captive through the hollow, deceptive philosophy, the human tradition, and the elemental spiritual force of this war rather than on Christ. I don't know if you still remember a few months ago when I was administering Holy Communion, how I struggled with this. <laughs> I tried to break this. My family were at, were at home watching and were saying, oh, what's it going to? Pastor Ned wasn't around. He was equally chuckling with my experience. You wouldn't know that this is a fake bread. Unless... <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate that. It's a fake bread. Friends, I was deceived <laughs> by the appearance. It looks like bread, but it's not bread. I need to discern. If I had been told that this is fake bread, I wouldn't have tried to break it. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing to us this morning. We have the information and we have the knowledge that there will be imposters. There will be people who will come to deceive us. Watch out. We need to discern. Friends, imposters are fraudulent. And their claims and activities are not easily identified. When a person claims that they are of God, yet their lives cause doubt, even remotely, watch out. Because Paul says, flee from all appearances of evil. We need to ask ourselves, what does their life or lifestyle tell us about who Jesus is? How do they conduct themselves towards others, especially the poor, the vulnerable, those considered to be social outcasts? Because we see from the book of Mark, particularly as we start reading, uh, studying chapter 1 through 12, Jesus identifying 
with those who are emerging. But not only that, he walked towards integrating them into the society, empowering them, telling them, I see you. I hear you. I feel the pain in your heart. You belong to me. You belong to my family. You are part of my plan. I came because of you. I want to ask you, if you've ever been drawn to someone, what drew you? Was it their charisma or their character? Someone said this to me. Charisma without character is a catastrophe waiting to explode. I think there is truth to that statement. We become susceptible to deception when we look for hope and security in the wrong place and from the wrong people. Jesus said, see that deceive you. The second thing that Jesus talked about is a command he gave to his disciples to bear witness to the gospel, death, persecutions, and sufferings. Jesus' instructions move from discernment to interpersonal realities. Not only were the disciples to take heed of the events around them and avoid imposters, but they were also to take heed of themselves. In verse 9, Jesus said, you must be on your guard. Why? Because you will be handed to local officials, to governors, to kings. There is an underlying assumption here that believers will be persecuted. Jesus didn't say, if you are. That was not the statement by Jesus. He said, when you are. There is an assumption that this will happen to us as believers. No wonder, Paul said, all who want to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3, 12. And elsewhere, in Romans 8, 35, he asked, who shall separate us from the love of God? He listed all kinds of stuff. He concluded, there is nothing there is no one that should separate us from the love of God. Particularly, our obedience to our God. Nothing should separate us. And this is why Paul expresses conviction about the proclamation of the gospel. In Romans 1, 14 through 16, he used three words, very strong words. He said, I am obligated to everyone. He listed the categories of people. That I am obligated because I'm a disciple of of Christ. He said, I am eager. Why? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God that brings salvation. You can see why Jesus said we need to persevere even when we are brought before kings to still testify of the gospel. I guess for us in the U.S., persecution and suffering might feel distant. Brothers and sisters, I wonder if this feeling is real or constructed. I wonder if this feeling that we have is real or it is constructed. Let me offer three questions and a story to illustrate how identifying with Jesus could lead to persecution, and how persecution should lead to the proclamation of the gospel. Our friend Karen, this is a pseudonym, it's not uh, the, her real name. Karen is a friend of ours. During Bible studies, not in this church, so don't try to figure out who Karen is, not in this church. During Bible studies, she shared her struggle to communicate the gospel to others. She shared how her Muslim colleague will always excuse himself for his Friday prayers. Now, in case you don't know, 
Friday prayers is equivalent to Sunday morning worship. But our friend has never openly identified as a Christian, let alone share her faith. I suspect someone here can identify with our friend's struggle. For most Christians in some North American countries, their greatest persecution and suffering is within themselves. The fear of intimidation, embarrassment, the fear of not getting it right, the fear of rejection, the fear of not quite sure even what to say. But here is Jesus encouraging the believers that when you are faced with such situation, depend on the Holy Spirit. John 15, 26, 27, the Holy Spirit is called our helper. Even in suffering and persecution, we are not alone. What can we learn from our brothers and sisters who are enduring and persevering under intense hostility because of their Christian faith? One Roland Boyd Macmillan suggests three questions that we should ask ourselves so that we can reshape our perspective. He said, is my God big enough? How big is your God? And what are you willing to give up because of your relationship with him? Some of us here might have health emergency. Some, it might be financial. Some, it might be work-related or relationship. But our brothers and sisters elsewhere, the emergencies on a daily basis is constant persecution. And Boyd McMillan went ahead to say that we live in a world of, I, sorry, their experiences and testimony of deliverance and endurance should increase our faith and inspire us to dare to be a witness to the gospel as though God and our God is big enough for that. This should be able to boost our faith. And the second question is, am I in enough trouble for Jesus? Sometimes cultures and values are at odds with the gospel. At other times, comfort and convenience may be at odds with the gospel. He states, it is the gospel itself that gets us into trouble, not ourselves. We live in a world of idols, and if we refuse to worship those idols, the idols, ironically, will hit back at us. In other words, so long as you don't bow down to idols, so long as you choose to obey Christ in proclaiming the gospel, they will hit back at you. And hence my question, those, the fears that we have, are they real or constructed? The third and the last question is, am I walking the way of the cross? May the faith of others believers be a model to us. In Acts 4, 19, 20, we read, this is the apostles now responding to the Sahindra, which is right in God's eyes. To listen to you or to God. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Brothers and sisters, these disciples were aware of the danger before them. Yet they had the audacity to say this before the leaders. That, hey, we've heard you, but we have a mandate from someone that is greater than you, and he's big enough for us to suffer for him. Therefore, we will continue to share the good news. I wonder what these three questions have opened up to you. Is my God big enough? Am I in enough trouble for Jesus? Am I walking the way of the cross. Friends, as we continue to wait for the second coming of Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, all of these things will happen to you. Be warned. 
Your right response shall be that you will persevere to the end by depending on the Holy Spirit. And the last thing that Jesus drew their attention to is the assurance of his second coming. Hallelujah. I'm so excited that he's coming back again. This is the truth. Every eye will see him, including those that rejected him. When it comes to the second coming of Jesus, I don't think the problem with us, most Christians, is not believing that he's coming. I know that some of us struggle with that. But I think it's accepting the reality of the unknowns surrounding his coming. There are so many unknowns. Like Pastor Nate said earlier on, Mark 13 is one of the most commented chapters in the entire New Testament. We are trying to figure out things. Don't get me wrong. It's good, it's good for us to be diligent in studying scriptures, in wanting to know, to go deeper. I guess that's why some of us will pay thousands of dollars to go to the seminary. Because we want to know. We want to learn. We want to grow. And we want in our growth to help others grow as well. But we shouldn't be stuck in trying to figure it out. In Matthew 24, 27, Jesus said, His coming is like lightning. Friends, the first century listener, what, had, what they heard from Jesus is that the coming of Jesus has a mysterious character. Behold, He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Revelation 1 7. Even so. Amen. And Hebrew 9 28. Again, another passage that speaks of the coming of Christ. That so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear. A second time. Not to deal with sins, but to save those who eagerly waiting for him. Brothers and sisters, as we look around to so watch the news, the things that we are hearing and seeing are alarming. The question is, I will lean into the opportunities that God is giving us to first share the gospel by first living out the gospel and then proclaiming it. If you notice, Jesus used about three different wordings to encourage us to speak the word when we are persecuted. You know, that not to be passive, but to be active proclaimers. My heart breaks as I watch the news over what is going on in Ukraine. It breaks my heart. I have very vivid memory of situations like that back in Nigeria. I can stand here and talk to you about how our churches, the two last churches we pastor, we are destroyed not once, not twice. I can stand here and talk to you about how children, about 12 children, were born in our church. The problem is not the events that are happening, but how we respond to those events, especially because Jesus had warned us. He's coming, he said. Friends, the second coming, like I mentioned, it's not like a puzzle where we get to arrange all the pieces together to figure out the chronology of the events and the exact date and time when Jesus returns. If that were to be important, he would have told us. In one of the parables here, as we look at verses 32, 33, Jesus said, but that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, 
but only the Father. I know that this is another problem, matic test for us. How do we interpret it? If we believe that Jesus is God, He knows everything. Here, Jesus is claiming limitation. I don't know what to do with the text either. Why? I want to be content with what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 29, 29. The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them. But we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of his instruction. If Jesus said, not the angels, not him, I'll stop at that. But he gave some signs. He said, all of these things that I've given you are signs. They will come to pass. And my coming will be for this generation. So the question is, how do we even interpret the word or the phrase, this generation? That is another bomb that we need to jump. I think the way to understand this generation is to hold intention. The history and the future. What do I mean by that? To hold intention, the first recipient of this message, when Jesus said, this generation shall not pass until all of these things come to pass. And to realize also that when Jesus was speaking to them, we see that even in Acts and John 15 and 17, that, hey, I'm not praying just for these ones today that are listening to me. But I'm praying for those who will believe through their message. I know that in the Jewish culture, a generation is about 40 years. But also elsewhere, as we read Mark 8, 12 and 13, again, Jesus uses this same phrase, this, gener uh, this generation, which refers to Jesus' contemporary, particularly he was denouncing their sins. So I think we can, we can come to a, the conclusion that perhaps what Jesus was referring to was this generation that were listening to him, but also those who will come in the future. In other words, as far as the timing is concerned, we do not have the exact timing. That is a prerogative of the Father. I believe without a doubt that the second coming of Christ will be glorious, decisive, sudden, and visible. Friends, any interpretation of Christianity which lacks this future hope is not in alignment with biblical teaching. The second coming of Christ is, is real. It's going to happen. And I hope that the hope of the second coming of Christ inspires you as a gift from God so that you continue to watch faithfully. Brothers and sisters, here in Mark 13, we try to look at three things. Jesus drew our attention by warning us not to fall prey. He invites us to depend on the Holy Spirit. And he said, only the Father knows. I wonder if you've noticed how Mark carefully crafted the Trinity into the story of the second coming of Christ. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. God the Father. God the Son, he said, be one. People are going to deceive you about him. You need to depend on the Holy Spirit. And hold on to the promises of God. My hope and prayer is that as covenanters, we will consciously depend on the Holy Spirit as we wait for the second coming of Christ. Will you be ready? 
when he comes.